6, Miss Stewart here. In the last chapter of The House with Chicken Legs, Marinka has the ceremony of bonding where she meets all the other Jagger and at the end of that chapter the gate opens and she runs towards the gate and jumps and that's where we left it. So today's chapter is called Darkness. Darkness. Everything slows as I fly towards the gate. Flowering vines break and fall around me. The jaws of the Jagger drop open and they breathe in sharply. Some place their hands over their mouths. Eyes widen in shock and lights. Reflected from deep inside the void, flicker across their pupils. Air rushes past my ears and the tide of black ocean pulls me downwards. I brace myself as the cold currents reach up and creep over my head and neck. But then claws dig into my back. Someone grabs my arm and a fierce pain tears through my head as I connect with the floor. Darkness and silence engulf me, punctuated by the faint sound of a balakla playing my favourite lullaby. My eyes flicker open and I see the collection of the blurry Yaga faces leaning over me with crinkled, concerned expressions. I squeeze my eyes shut again and hot, angry tears burn its way down my ear. I wish I could sink into the floorboards and disappear. Yaga voices murmur above me. Is she all right? What was she doing? I think she tried to jump into the gate. Why would she do that? How strange. Is the party over? If only I could make my ears shut like my eyes. I don't want to see them or hear them. My head is pulsing where I banged it on the floor. My back sore where Jack scratched me and my arms aching from being yanked. But worse than all that is the blistering, withering feeling caused by all the yaggers staring down at me, talking about me. Is she conscious? Should we move her? Marinka, are you all right? She's fine. I hear the old Yaga's voice right next to me and feel her hand on my head. Let's give her more space. Yaga Onskin's voice rises above the rest and I push a gentle rush of grat sorry, I feel a gentle rush of gratitude towards him as he clears the room. My lungs ache and I realise I've been holding my breath. Rolling onto my side away from the old Yaga, I peer up at the gate. It's gone. I knew it would be, but it doesn't stop the tears from falling. They drip onto the floor as anger rushes up my neck. Why? I cry, my voice all gurgly, then I crumple into a ball as pain explodes through my head. Can you carry Marinka to the bedroom? The old Jagger asks, squashing something cold against my forehead. You've got a nasty bump, Marinka, but you'll be fine. Just try and rest for a moment. Jagger Wanskin's yellow bowler hat dips over me. His arms slide underneath me and I'm lifted into the air. Dark spot clouds my vision and my body is swallowed by a heavy numbness. The old Jagger and Jagger Wankin whisper by my door and then there is silence. Jack lands on the headboard and pushes his beak into my ear. I close my eyes and turn away from him. My head is throbbing. I was so close. I could have got Baba back if only... I drift in and out of an uncomfortable sleep. The house rolls rhythmically, its chicken feet drumming beneath me. I try to tell it to stop but my voice doesn't work. I try to move but the sheets feel like ropes, the bed like a cage. Finally the house slows and lurches to the ground. It keeps on tilting and I slide down the bed. I reach for the headboard. Too late. My body thumps onto the floor and the headboard pushes and rolls me towards the front door. What's going on, I croak, trying to scramble to my feet. The front door opens, I skid through and I'm bumped down each of the porch steps until I land in a heap on a hard, dry earth outside the house. I sit up and blink and rub my neck. We're back in the market. It's dark and the world is spinning. The old Jagger walks calmly down the steps after me. Behind her, the house swings shut and all the window slide closed. What's going on? I ask again. House, what are you doing? The house rises up and turns its back to me. Your house is upset with you. The old Jagger helps me to my feet. Why? My voice sounds whiny. I clear my throat and try again. Why are you upset? This time I sound angry. I kick the rear porch in frustration and the house shuffles away from me. Come on, the old Jagger squeezes my arm. Your house is tired. She's run a long way tonight. Let her rest. You can make up in the morning. I let the old Jagger lead me away from my home, along the dark, empty streets of the market and past the skulls and bottles of her spirit trust store. 
The lintel above the old Jagger's front door welcomes us with a smile. The front room is warm, smelling of fireworks and borscht. I flop into a chair by the fire, my head aching and foggy. Why is my house so upset with me? I ask the old Jagger. she passes me a mug of cocoa. I don't understand. No one likes to be tricked. The old Jagger sits opposite me. Your house thought you were going to bond with her tonight, but you just wanted to go through the gate. I was going to bring Baba home. Anger burns my eyes and my voice rises. Why didn't the house understand that? Why didn't Jack understand that? Why don't you understand that? Why did you all have to interfere? I could have got Baba back if you hadn't have stopped me. I glare at the old Jagger, my breath coming in short jagged gasps that hurt my lungs. We stopped you because we care. Going through the gate is dangerous. You might never return. It's worth the risk, I yell. I'd do anything to bring Baba home. And it's my decision anyway. You had no right. Your Baba is gone, the old Jagger says quietly. You're wrong, I shout, raising my feet. My head spins, my mug falls and smashes on the floor. I stare down at my hands and see the broken mug and spilled cocoa right through them. My whole body fades and for a moment I feel light and fleeting as the morning mist. As I flicker back and breath rushes into my lungs. Sit down, Marinka, please. The old Jagger rushes for my hand, but I pull away from her and stagger to the door. Pushing it open, I pick up speed and burst out into the market. It's cold and dark, but it's that hazy darkness just before dawn. A few market traders are setting up their stalls, rubbing their hands together and breathing little white clouds into the air. I race past them. I need my house and I need Baba. The old Jagger is wrong. I can bring Baba back and I will. Baba will make everything all right. My vision blurs. I stop to wait for the world to swing back into focus and the familiar comforting scent of wood smoke wraps around me. I breathe in deeply, straight in my spine and walk calmly on back towards my house. The smell of wood smoke grows stronger. It curls through the air, thickening as I draw closer to home. I walk faster, breaking into a run. Something is wrong, the smoke is too thick. Cracks of burning, splintering wood break the silence. A jackdaw shrieks. I sprint as fast as I can, lungs heaving, legs pounding the ground. I hear people shouting and the splash of water. I round the corner and see it, what I was trying not to think. The house, my house, is on fire. And there's the picture of the house on fire. And that's the end of that chapter. The next chapter is called Fire. Fire. We didn't mean to set it on fire. Salma runs in front of me, arms outstretched, as if she could block my view of the house. Tears are streaming down her face, leaving thick trails of soot and ash coating her skin. We are going to help my father set up his stall, but we noticed your house was facing the other way. We thought that was strange, so we were just looking, and then Lamia thought she saw a giant leg underneath your porch and bones on the floor. And I said that was stupid, so I lit the match to prove her wrong. And... She takes a deep breath, juddering. I saw a skull. I panicked and fell. And then there was a fire everywhere and I couldn't put it out. It all happened so quickly. I'm so, so sorry. Her face crumples in confusion. Why is there a skull under your house? I push past Selma and run to my house, but strong arms grip my shoulders and a deep voice tells me it's not safe. Men and women rush back and forth, carrying water and shouting to each other. Lamia is sitting on the floor, rocking and muttering something about skulls and huge claws. This is all my fault. If I hadn't kept Nina from the gate, Baba wouldn't have gone with her, and I wouldn't have ended up here in this stupid market with Lamia and Salma. Why couldn't they leave my house alone? Smoke billows into the night sky. My whole house is burning, blackening. Inside, a monstrous roaring fire, like the fire that took away my parents and my life. I stare at it in disbelief. For as long as I can remember, I've been haunted by visions of Yaga House in flames, but this is real, right in front of me. A fire blazing hotter and huger than I could ever have imagined, threatening to take away everything I love now. My house, Jack, Benji, all my hopes for the future. Jack, I shout, struggling against the arms holding me. The house, the walls of the house creak and crackle and my body flickers like a wispy 
like the wispy dead. I pass right through the arms, holding me and rush towards the house. Jack! I call again as loud as I can, then cough as ash fills air hits the back of my throat. He flies down out of the smoke, smashes onto my shoulder and scrambles into my arms. Jack! I sob. Where's Benji? Jack flaps awkwardly towards the back of the house and I race after him. The porch is alive with flames. I lift my arms to shield my face from the intense heat and edge closer to the fire. Benji is bleating madly, banging against the bones of his shelter. I step onto the porch, the heat and smoke burning my lungs. My dress feels like it is melting onto my skin. Benji pushes his head through the gap near the water butt and calls me urgently. I kick the water butt once, twice, three times and it crashes over, spilling the bones and sending steam into the air. The flames fall back a little and I fumble with the latch on the shelter but my fingers keep fading in and out. Before I can open the shelter, the whole house lurches sideways and I have to grab the balustrade to stay upright. The ground swings away as the house rises up, its legs on fire, crackling in the heat. People shout and scream below, their shocked faces shining through the smoke. Stop! I yell, squeezing the balustrade with both hands. The living can see, but then I realise there's no choice. Putting the fire out is far more important. The house runs faster and faster, jumping over people, market stalls and buildings. Flames and smoke fly behind us like hair. Burned shards of wood fall and the ground like tiny meteors in slow motion and sparks dance like fireflies around us. The blur of harbour lights reflected in the calm of the ocean lies ahead. With a final giant leap, the house soars through the air and lands with a sizzling splash in the water. A cold wave slaps over me. Benji cries and Jack squawks loudly. I slip on the floorboards and taste salt and charcoal on my lips. The house creaks and sighs, sloshing from side to side until the flames are extinguished. And we're sitting in a great smouldering cloud of acrid smoke. Jack flaps onto my lap amid a spray of gritty water. I wrap my arms around him, dragging us both to the back door and push it open. He slops into the house, a mass of slippery wet feathers, and I go back for Benji. By the time we're all safe inside the damp blackened room, the house is on the move again, splashing through the shallows, stepping over sand, running through the desert and climbing uphill into the mountains and forest. I find blankets on the high shelves in Baba's room. They stink of smoke, but at least they're dry. I peel off my clothes and wrap myself in them, sit in Baba's chair with Benji on my lap and Jack on my shoulder, and we sway gently together as the house gallops on through the night. I'm so sorry, I whisper to the rafters. I didn't mean to trick you or upset you. It's just that I miss Baba so much. Bringing her home means everything to me. She's the only person I've ever known and loved, and I'm scared to live without her. I need her. Not just so she can guide the dead and save me from being guardian, I need her here to love me and keep me safe. A vine curls down from the rafters and wraps around me. It thickens as it holds me close and I lean my head against its soft velvety bark. Tendrils coil over Baba's headscarf, which is bunched up in my hands. As they entwine with the fabric, I realise for the first time that the house misses Baba too. Take us somewhere deserted, I say. Somewhere with no people. I've had enough of the living. I want things to go back to the, the way they were. Just me, Baba and the house guiding the dead. And that is the end of that chapter today. Speak to you soon, year five and six. Take care. Bye.